Hi there, my name is Kayla Vega, and I'm going to be reading to you from my collection Dunk Tank. You can see my reading copy here is covered in stickers. Um, this collection came out last spring from House of the Nancy Press, and I will also be reading um, one or two new poems depending on how much time permits. Um, I want to thank uh, the folks at Poetry London for um, inviting me to read especially David and Sile who sent out the invitation. It's an honor to be here. The first uh, poem I'm going to read tonight is the title poem of the collection, which kind of gives a sense of the, um, the book's themes and voice. Dunk Tank. The volleyball girls wrestle in jello. Travis Lechner Lead screamer of occult nosebleed commands the 10th grade stoners to live real. Their French teacher struts like a heron, beige socks hiked up to his knees. You've been suckered into a shift at the dunk tank to fundraise for a school in Tanzania. You'll be dunked six times, twice by a boy named Bryce you love but never talk to. When he runs out of money, he'll throw gas at you chunks of hot dog, himself. You climb up and wave to your friends eating Filipino kebabs by the track. Tonight, you'll all drink coolers by the waterfall. This is the year Dustin Klepsch will drive his ATV off a cliff. You sit above the drunk goggle obstacle course in the root beer guzzling contest, and you know you know everything. Can diagram reproductive systems of worms, Know exactly when two trains traveling 60 kilometers an hour will meet in Kitwanga for lunch. This is the year your mom's kidneys will fail while you're in history, and the year Christy will stop talking to you and painting sad, lovely portraits of her dogs. Bryce pays $2 to throw three balls at you. The wind sighs like it's locked its keys in its car. You're sitting on your chair, smart girl, only your chair drops, and before you fall, there's this moment you're sitting on nothing, and you think, maybe you won't fall after all. Maybe you'll just hover here forever. Um, the next poem I'll read is for a dear friend of mine, Matthew Walsh, whose debut collection, These Are Not the Potatoes of My Youth, was just uh, announced to be a finalist for the Trillium Book Prize, and it just finished um, being shortlisted for the Gerald Lampert as well. It's a fantastic collection, um, and I recommend you go out and read it. So um, for Matthew, this poem is called Salmon and Potato Salad. Matthew, I am stretching the O's in your poems into lifesavers, so gray daily moments don't drown me. Now I am running my fingers cautiously along the underside of my studio chair to assess the grossness of its previous owner until I realize tease sounds like tease and feel a ping. In Toronto, you are steaming milk and metal pitchers while your mind grows a book of potato po poems. I listen to printmakers argue over whether or not to buy chocolate bars or continue printing books so trendy you don't even read them. I move three words up a line, then back down. Matthew, the bathroom in this place is like the setting of a Chuck Palahniuk short story in which bad things happen to your body so that the reader passes out. Megan says there's a second bathroom if I don't want to encounter art on the toilet. I don't want to encounter much of anything on the toilet, especially nothing sculpted by snacky voices past yawn partition. Every afternoon, I watch several of them in two short sweatpants pour the communal kettle onto mugs of noodles. How much like fishing poetry is, casting lines until something larger bites. I hardly have time to zip my jeans, exit the art, and scribble that down before my brain flushes the bowl. Once, 
I reeled a salmon to shore, but was too afraid of its teeth to stick my hand into its gill and lift it. In the photo, I stand grinning beside my father, who dangles its rainbow belly beside my head. I really miss him. Things happen, and I don't know how they go together, but neither do you, sculpting swans out of hot foam and poems out of the rocky soil of your youth. I've never lifted a fish. The voices shrink on their way to chocolate, like a memory growing too old to remember what it ate for breakfast. Someone says, where did Matthew go? Who does that guy think he is? I am not totally sure I know who I think you are anymore or what I'm doing in the city I can't afford and that you fled. Then you text me a photo of beautiful iridescent pigeons and I'm dragged back onto shore. Um, while I was writing this book, I lived in um, Vancouver, as that last poem sort of somewhat alludes to, and I worked at a bar um, during this time, um, which was called the possibly the most nerdy bar in Canada, according to no the National Post. Um, it's the sort of place that has like a big vending machine for 20-sided die for Dungeons and Dragons, a huge um, sculpture of Han Solo trapped in carbonite. Um, everything on the birdie, the sorry, everything on the menu is super nerdy, um, and we play old, we played old movies um, and science fiction on the TV. And while I was working there, um, the boss decided that we had to start selling. Um, dinosaur erotica in, um, in vending machines and that because I was a writer I should uh, write this uh, dinosaur erotica and this poem is called Tender like Beverly Tender all anyone ever wants to hear about is the dinosaur erotica I wrote for the nerd bar I work at I can't remember how I was asked to write wet hot allosaurus summer to be sold in vending machines under the Millennium Falcon. Many events seem arbitrarily arrived at, and when one begins to doubt the whole concept of narrative, it can be hard to imagine a convincing rising action between Tanis, a lonely farm girl, and a ripped, impossibly resurrected Allosaurus named Big Al, who works on oil rigs. It can suck your tank empty, not knowing how moments connect as they seem randomly suspended in amber. Tana sits in anticipation on her tin roof, and Big Al stares at his footprints in the mud, wondering when they will fossilize, like this plot. The first part of my life was a prehistoric bug. The second part was a second prehistoric bug. More life, more bugs crushed on the windshield, bug marmalade under the wipers. The part of my life I spent, ri spent writing dinosaur erotica is encased in honey resin. It was senseless and lovely, like buying textbooks online while someone you love eats you out. Possible it seemed to layer and escape from New York sour by night and rolling up one's hair into the solemn knot of the erotic novelist, then wake and type the word throbbing, to feel one's typing fingerprints throbbing, to call oneself something tender, like Beverly Tender, and research what Be Big Al's throbbing member may have looked like, if it arced, and how. Um. Sometimes I just want to write like a follow-up poem later. Um, based on the reaction I get to a poem. Um, and so this one from my new manuscript kind of, kind of addresses that last one. Another poem about dinosaurs. Recently, while reading my dinosaur erotica poem out loud at a festival, I thought, is this it? Is this the life I wanted when I was a child? To grow up and tell the world's longest dinosaur dick joke? to a room full of startled literary strangers? Well, no, of course not. 
Though it's true as a child, I loved dinosaurs and often would visual visualize their bones deep below me in the earth wherever I walked. My thoughts were not sexual. Mostly I wanted to stop wearing such awful sweaters with applique caps and collars my mother brought me home from Northern Reflections. I wanted, if I'm honest, to be smarter than anyone. I wanted a journal with a lock, but when I got one, I wrote in it only once, recording in my best third grade cursive, this book belongs to Kayla Vega. Whenever I said something extra embarrassing, I wanted to switch schools or sail to Antarctica to study penguins slip and sliding on milky green ice. Like everyone, I wanted the one precious long john in the dozen. I wanted my own private Narnia, days of the week socks, and the indefinite cancellation of gym class. Every Friday, wearing Friday socks, I wanted to bring in the winning item to show and tell to finally best Ben Rumley's silkworm collection. So one Friday, I brought in a rock my father discovered in the dirt near Drumheller, an ancient shell all curled up like a cinnamon bun, extracted it from my backpack and held it up so the light would glimmer along its iridescent hull. But then no one said anything. No one cared about something so old and so dead. They couldn't even tell what it was or had been. So now I'm telling you, hundreds of millions of years ago, that rock was a living thing, as was my father when he found it. That's my show and tell contribution. These thoughts and feelings are extinct in me now but I've written them down to prove they once lived. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, stay safe. And I hope the weather is great wherever you are.